Well, we want to continue on tonight in our class portion of looking at reasons that I began some time ago on why I believe in God. I believe in God, and I may have alluded to this, because man, by his very nature, is a worshiping being. There's within the very nature, the way we're made up of every person accountable to God for his actions, the desire to worship. The very fact of this worshiping nature argues strongly for the existence of a supreme being to be worshiped. So when we understand that the atheist says there is no eternal being of any kind, no metaphysical or spiritual anything, but everything here is by chance evolution over multiply millions of years from what they have to say is eternal, which is matter, rocks and dirt, that evolved without any purpose, totally by accident, to where we are today. How do you account for such an evolved thing to want to worship anything? And you can't. There's no explanation for it. That a rock could evolve finally into something that worships uh, a being that never was there in the first place. These are concepts that imply that there is a God. Uh, materialism just simply can never account for this worshiping nature of man. Among those primitive people, people so far removed from God and his word, you find him worshiping. That's what I mean by being in the nature of man. We're not saying the worship is acceptable, but we're saying simply, why do they worship at all? And why do they worship anything? That needs to be brought out when we're dealing with people in general and nowadays with secularism, materialism all over the place and permeating everything, and great ignorance of the Bible or anything religious much, then if we ever get a chance to study with somebody, you could even say, well, why, since you're interested in studying the Bible, where did that come from, your interest to study the Bible? How could it evolve from dead rocks and dirt, from matter, into an interest in studying the Bible if there wasn't something about your nature that doesn't prompt you to do something like that? So it fits right into the matter of worship, the study of the Bible, or being interested in anything religious, if it is the case, as the atheist says, that there simply is nothing spiritual. It's all material, and everything is of secular origin. Well, another reason that needs to be seen regarding this particular view that we're dealing with I do not believe that something came out of nothing. Now, we've been exposed to this lately. It's spring. I've brought those things up a number of times. We've heard others in past lectureships bring it up. It's simply an old axiom that out of nothing, nothing comes. And you can look into all the scientific works there are, and you'll never find anything in any discipline of science that will uphold the idea that out of nothing, something came. It'll always show that there has to be not only a cause, but an adequate cause. So it's not sufficient to say that all that now is came out of the material. 
if that were the case, then this would not explain the existence of the material. And that's where we are to a great extent today is if matter is eternal, uh, how do you have anything in the world prove such a thing? But if it is, how did it get busy being there's nothing life, life about it or living about it? How did it get busy and turn into life? So you have to explain where material came from. Of course, some people are saying, well, it just uh, happened or whatever. But see, there's no answer. There's no scientific answer. Remember that uh, if you're dealing with science, you must be able to apply the five senses to whatever it is, and it has to be in the present. If you don't, you're outside the realm of science. Science cannot deal with it if it does not follow the scientific method. Um, this would not explain how the inanimate produced the animate. What we have to conclude is that something is, therefore, something always was. And that something has to be an adequate cause. Thus, we do not hesitate to say that there's always been and never has been anybody that can prove otherwise that God is the first cause and the uncaused first cause. Now, may, people may not be able to grasp that. They may not understand it and all that kind of thing. But it's like I've used many times. Uh, we don't know all about electricity, but we have enough understanding of it to really utilize it, don't we? So before you can benefit from something does not mean you have to know all there is to know about it. In fact, some people have said, if you say that you can know, then you're claiming omniscience. No, that's not the case. But if it is knowable, then a man can know it and know that he knows it. We'll get more about that maybe a little later. Um, no man can logically deny. Notice I said logically. Logically deny the existence of God. Now, if one wants to logically try to deny the existence of God, here's what would happen. He would have to know everything. Because if there was one thing he did not know, it might be the fact that God exists. He would have to be present everywhere it's possible to be present. For if there was one place where he was not, God might be there. But if one knew everything and could be everywhere present, guess what? He would be God. And that's the thing that needs to be saddled on these people's minds. And it needs to be said to a lot of our young people. It might help to get them to even start thinking more with their minds than what seems to be done, not only by young people, but even older people. What has been going on in these United States and elsewhere, but especially in these United States, on places, on camp campuses of great learning and, and universities that are noted for all of their great uh, learning and professors of high claim and all of that, has been a dumbing down, for lack of a better way to put it, of not only the professors, but even the students. The ignorance that prevails among so-called educated people is absolutely amazing. And then when you consider how it was back when people were more apt to believe in God and believe the Bible's the word of God, and the ignorance that exists then, well, you can just multiply that countless times over. It's where we are today. 
when people can look at a fact, and the fact is just what a thing is, and deny that it is, there's not much you can do with that person. Because that's going to affect that person's idea of what is truth. Pertinent facts put together pertaining to a given matter determines the truth about that matter. And we have a lot of people today denying the obvious. And think about how it is with the atheist. He's denying that really, which is quite obvious, he has warped his intellectual powers. He's just crazy intellectually is what it comes down to. Well, I can never be an atheist. If I were going to be an atheist, I would certainly have to be honest with myself. And then that raises the question, well, if I'm an atheist, therefore everything came from dead rocks and dirt over multiplied millions of years of chance evolution. How does the concept of honesty ever form? You ever seen an honest rock? An honest glass of water? The very concept of honesty cannot derive itself from that which is non-living. And that's a very important point to emphasize about a person's like the nature of man to worship. Where does that come from? So in order to be an atheist, and I'm going to list some things here, some we've already done. Well, in fact, we, we've touched on all of them, really. But in a list, they'll kind of come together, maybe be emphasized. I would, If I were to be an atheist, I would have to accept the view that life can come from non-life. Life can come from non-life. If I'm going to be an atheist, I would have to say that something can come from nothing. I would have to accept the idea that order can come out of disorder. That Cosmos can come out of chaos. And I think most of us know that cosmos is from where ladies get their term of cosmetics in the sense of making things up orderly fashion. So when a lady's putting on her cosmetics, she's trying to get in order. <laughs> That's a joke. You're supposed to laugh. So the chat, I have to say also, that I'd have to believe that chance can produce arrangement. Think about that a little bit. Chance can produce arrangement. When something is arranged, what does it imply? It implies someone or being to arrange it. I would have to believe that there can be a design without a designer. We've mentioned that a number of times. I'd have to believe that uh, like, L-I-K-E, like, does not produce like. That there can be an effect without a cause. That mind can be produced by matter, and we can we can produce a, a proceed with that and the implications of it for a long time because the atheists like to consider themselves great intellectuals, and they are highly learned, maybe in certain fields. But how can we trust what they learn? Because there's no mind to them; it's just material matter called a brain. Now, what makes it work? Well, it's the product of millions of years of an accident. No mind behind the design of the mind. <laughs> so how can we trust that kind of thinking? And what is thinking? How can one even see likenesses 
and those things that are unlike. All of that indicates life and so on. You can see the implications of it if you think about it. Then, of course, I'd have to say there's no real purpose to life. I'm an atheist. There's no real purpose at all. Then, um, of course, I would say there's no hereafter. You, you die, you just go out of existence. Of course, that would mean the Bible is not in any form or fashion the word of God. And thus, I'd have to say there's no God. Now, I suggest to you that whatever atheist there is on this earth, he or she, if you take these that I've just mentioned, and as you say a long time ago, hold the atheist's feet to the fire, because that's what each one of these I just mentioned would be. If he's going to prove there is no God, he can't do it. You got to know enough to keep holding his his attention to that. And that's the reason that in, engaging in any kind of discussion with them where it's not properly arranged, where each one actually has a proposition that they can define so they can tell you what they mean by it, and then actually set out arguments to prove what the affirmative discussion does then if you can't get one into that kind of discussion, it's just going to come become a big uh, fuss that nothing happened. And a great many of these people want to do that. They don't have to answer questions. They don't have to be pressed. They make sure they don't put themselves in a position where they will be pressed on a certain matter, where they will have to meet the implications of the position they hold. And so we who are Christians and all the New Testament defines Christian to be ought to be equipped enough so where we can press these points on them. First of all, you have to know them to press them, but to show them what they are actually saying when they say these particular matters, what they actually are implying by them, such as there's never been a design without a design. Just keep pressing that on them. And all these others just load up on them. Every conclusive argument which shows that the Bible is a miraculous product, the inspired, plenary inspired word of the living God, verbally inspired is an argument that emphasizes that atheism is a false philosophy. I've said this and have preached on it at different times. If I had one chance to speak to an audience on the existence of God, what would I do? I would speak on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I would show how it is a historical fact. And we would go from there. Because if Jesus Christ, as the Bible says, was put to death and raised on the third day to die no more, then everything else in the Bible by implication is true. Everything I say by implication is true. One of the interesting things about Islam is that they deny what even many people who don't believe in Christ as a Savior will admit, and that is that uh, he was put to death. And they will deny that he really was put to death. They just think that the apostles and others were fools. So the very thing that is more provable than about anything else, they reject. And that would be the point that I would aim at real strongly in dealing with them. There are many sufficient arguments 
you can gather that from what we've been studying. And the only way we would be able to really get into those would be to have to spend a, be like taking a course in college where we would have to study each one of those to get the full impact of them. But don't let the highly educated person, just because he has a lot of academic degrees and written a lot of books, uh, cause you not use the mind God gave you. It doesn't make any difference whether a fellow has a PhD in philosophy or physics or whatever it might be and says, well, God does not exist. That's not going to change the fact, and I'll use my old adage again, that's not going to change the fact that uh, those live oak trees out in front of the Spring Church building do not, that they do not evidence design. They do. And if they evidence design, there must be. It's inescapable. There must be a designer with the wherewithal to do that. Sometimes we let them drag us all off into their particular field in which they probably do know more uh, than a lot of folks would because of their intense study. But it doesn't get them past the, op the obvious. If there's design in a thing, there had to be a designer. All there's to it. And I don't care how intricate you get with something. It doesn't change. Well, so much for the atheists, at least right now. I want to now talk about the false philosophy of agnosticism. A great many people, if you talk to them, you might think they're atheists, but an atheist says, I know God does not exist. Here. But really, when you press them, they, as I talked about earlier in pressing them, they will tend to back up and say, well, maybe... Maybe there's just not enough information in to know one way or the other. Well, that's the agnostic. The Greek word, ginosko, I might say here in passing that the very first few weeks, you're in your first Greek class after you've learned the alphabet and things about like that so that you can, you can at least read a Greek word. You're going to start learning vocabulary. One of the very first words you're going to learn is Gnosko. It simply means I know. And so when you come, if you want to say, I don't know, as a certain party whom we all know said, don't, don't. If you want to say that, you simply put what's called, it's the first letter of the Greek alphabet, Alpha, which is called an alpha primitive, you just plug it in front of Gnosko. Well, if Gnosko means I know, then it's just like uh, A before theist. It means no God. Well, theist means God. So a Greek would simply say, Agnosko, I don't know. Are you hungry? Agnosko. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, you, there's some things where you can say, I don't know. So that's that's what we're talking about. Now, the word, our English word, agnostic, is a, it's just a transliteration of the Greek word, agnosko. I don't know. Um, so whereas, as I said earlier, that the atheist says, I know there is no God. The agnostic simply is holding that there's not sufficient evidence to conclude one way or the other. You can't prove it that there is a God, or you can't prove there's not a God. And not that you'd want to necessarily, necessarily try to prove a, a negative, but I won't try to get off into that. <laughs> If there's a universal negative, you can't affirm it, but that's another story. Um, 
So the agnostic just simply says, I don't know. Now, we mentioned early on in our study about Kierkegaard and his existentialism. And agnosticism gets pretty close to, to his view of in existentialism. Existentialism simply applies the notion that it is impossible for one to know two other areas in addition to the matter, that matter uh, of the existence of God. You just, it's just not in man to come to that conclusion. Well, in a sense, agnosticism, of course, is contradictory. And I think we've, I don't know how many times I've mentioned this over the years in preaching, make the point. We'll do it again. It is absolutely, for it to, to be absolutely certain that uh, it's impossible for one to know or not know God exists. Think about that for a minute. You're saying, I'm absolutely certain that you cannot be absolutely certain. If it's possible for a human being to know that particular fact, if it is a fact as they claim it is, then there must be a process by which a human being can come to know something. And if there's such a process, why cannot the process be applied to the problem of the existence of God? And if there is no process by which a human being can come to know, then how can one, such as an agnostic, be sure that one cannot know that God exists? Back in the late 60s and early 70s, I heard quite a bit in the church and heard some that actually held these views speak about the fact they would say, I'm using their terms here, that truth is not absolute. Well, I firmly believe truth is absolute and subjective. And there are some who hold in that truth is absolute. And I think everybody in this audience would. But some of them believe that it's not attainable, even though it's absolute, that it's impossible for one human be for human beings to, to know the truth. I think I mentioned sometime or another, back in 1969, Dr. James Atterbury at that time, head of the English Department at Hardy, took the position that yes, truth is absolute. It's out there. But we as human beings never can reach it. We just keep trying. We just keep trying. Well, that's what we mean when we start talking about some of these things about can you know it? Can you not know it? Is it possible to know it? So there were several of these, I hesitate to call them gospel preachers, but that's what they thought they were. They had quite a bit of uh, formal education, graduate degrees, and so forth. They actually set out to prove, now watch this. Think about the word prove. They actually set out to prove that you cannot prove that God exists. There's a word in logic for that. It's called an absurdity. And it flies back on itself. I know that some of these fellows were asked, well, are you sure about that? And guess what one of them did? He said, no. <laughs> now, I don't know what his lecture was good for when he did that, but you've heard me say at times, uh, 
how that if somebody says truth is not absolute and objective and humanly attainable, ask him if he's sure about that. If he says, I'm sure, then you say, well, you, you're so sure, you're absolutely sure. So you're absolutely sure that you cannot be absolutely sure. Well, you're at least absolutely sure about some thing, and thus the whole thing implodes, falls in on itself. And yet here are people with doctor's degrees and highly educated and know a lot of things, uh, but they don't see that. Well, my time looks like me is just about gone. So I want to close with prayer. If you would uh, bow with me. Holy Father, we're thankful that we can know thee, that we can know thy word, that thou hast given us in our creation the ability to know. We're thankful that we have thy word, and that our Lord has reminded us that the, it's the truth that we can know and that the truth will set us free. Bless all of us here to spend more time with the Bible and think with the principles of truth as we apply them to our lives and others. Be with the sick and afflicted, the orphans and widows, and especially these of the household of faith. We pray it all in Jesus' name.